Hello, my name is Makeda Mahario and you're watching a CNBC Africa special. Throughout 2019, we have managed to have some poignant conversations with key players across industries discussing topics like identifying top investment opportunities in Rwanda, growing female leadership in the private sector, how aid money is allocated among international NGOs versus homegrown solutions, and how the continent can create climate resilience. Over the next hour, we will be taking a peek into some of the key points made in these conversations. And first up, we have a conversation from the sidelines of 2019's Africa CEO Forum, featuring Rwanda Development Board's Chief Investment Officer, Guy Barron, and Group Chairman and CEO of Master Assets Investments, Yu Tung Chung. I think the attraction to Rwanda, which you've really seen increasing quite steadily over the last number of years is really a function of the country's attractiveness, both as a domestic market, but also very much as a hub. Uh, our attractiveness and ease of doing business, where we rank second on the continent, is obviously very compelling to a lot of investors coming in. I think our ability to position ourselves as a hub to the region, a hub to the continent, uh, is also extremely compelling, whether you're looking to attract um, interest in the company as a proof of concept or whether you're looking to access you know large consumer markets uh, export from Rwanda all of those are very viable options and very attractive options for investors to come and set up in Rwanda right you've set up at least two properties high-end properties in the country and that includes uh, the Marriott and uh, Century Park and of course we're looking forward to the Sheraton in the country Speak to me more from an investor perspective. Why of all the markets on the continent, Rwanda? Uh, well, first of all, uh, is the political stability, uh, the security, and uh, also, uh, you see, this is a CEO forum. Uh, at, uh, uh, Rwanda is attracting a lot of conferences into the country and, uh, and and you know people are surprised that uh, Rwanda is moving you know fast so fast but I'm not because uh, I've been here more than 10 years but uh, I can see the changes I, I can see the growth so uh, I'm not surprised because uh, you know many people actually uh, recently I bought some Italian uh, to visit Rwanda and uh, they were shocked you know, they've been to different uh, countries in the continent, but uh, when they arrive here, they see things are so clean, so well organized, the roads are so nice, uh, people are so nice, you know, and they, they actually say, you know, oh, it's uh, also beautiful people also. So uh, uh, there's a lot of things that comes in together to make things work. Uh, so uh, that's why Rwanda and, and the strategic location also, Rwanda is in the heart of uh, Africa. So uh, one of the reasons uh, that uh, I, I've been able to you know, invite people to come visit and also uh, uh, giving, them, giving them an idea of, you know, don't look at Rwanda uh, itself uh, because uh, uh, it can cover the whole of Africa. Billy, investing in a country is one. Staying in a country is another thing. Speak to me more on uh, the demand for high-end property. As a developer, are you seeing this in Rwanda? Uh, yes. Uh, I think every country, every market, you know, there's different demand from different level of people. Uh, there's always uh, demand for, for high-end, middle-class, you know, low-class, I mean, affordable, you know. so. Uh, everywhere has that, that high-end market. And uh, uh, Guy, coming back to you, of course, uh, what is uh, the Rwandan government currently doing in uh, terms of diversifying the economy? Of course, to sit in well with the current uh, uh, business uh, climate in the world. Mm, no, absolutely. And, and we've driven, we've attempted to drive a pretty fundamental structural shift in the composition of the economy to try to shift away to some degree from the reliance on agriculture. So if you look, for instance, about 10, 12 years ago, the agricultural sector constituted about 40 percent 
of the country's GDP. Today that's down to 28%, whereas services and manufacturing industry really make up 62% today. And so that diversification is happening, and it's happening while the economy has grown five times in the same period of time. And so we've taken a very hands-on approach to drive very uh, specific focus sectors, such as manufacturing, such as construction, such as the energy and infrastructure sectors, services and ICT, of course, are a big focus. And so uh, we've developed a number of projects at various stages, greenfield, brownfield, uh, some of those assets are privatization opportunities uh, out of government. So really a wide range of opportunities and a wide range of projects. And we also work closely with the private sector here in Rwanda to help uh, that lead the growth of the country. That's really uh, the focus in terms of uh, the continuation and the sustainability of the growth that we've seen. Uh, Rwanda's grown 7.5% consistently the last 10 years grew 8.6% last year, 2018, and we are very much committed to having the private sector be the leader of that growth. So we try to also focus on that as well. Uh, he spoke about something very interesting there about uh, seeing the Africa CEO Forum coming in, all the events that are in the country, and of course understanding that uh, the country hit a $75 million in just about seven months, uh, way ahead of the targets that are set for the mice industry. I just want to get it from you. What is being done right now as the government or as the country to actually see that we can see not only just have even more events coming into the country, but also putting Rwanda as a brand out there even with more visibility on it. What is being done to see that that is a possibility? I think we're very fortunate in that the narrative is strong. I think, uh, thankfully, the, uh, the word is out, should I say, and, and the recognition of Rwanda just seems to grow and grow. And so I think we've what been... What we have out, is it enough at the moment? I think it's generating a tremendous amount of momentum. Right. It's never enough, is the, is the honest answer. We can always do more. I think through investments that we've made in the convention center, investments we've made in the mice sector, whether it's hospitality or other types of events or entertainment. We've invested heavily in the airline, which obviously drives a lot of uh, connectivity. And then um, as we attract more investment, quite frankly, it, it begets more investment. And so what tends to happen is as companies come in, as investors come in, and I think as Billy said, people come and are exposed to Rwanda in, in forums similar to the CEO forum, there's a recognition. And, and, and that word spreads and we attract more investment and that then continues to drive the momentum. So I think in many ways it's to continue to do what we're doing. I think it's to intensify our efforts in many ways. We're constantly increasing our efforts to uh, outreach into other countries, whether it's conferences, events, whether it's forums, uh, to give a voice to Rwanda and give a presence to Rwanda. And it's also to some degree uh, some unique types of transactions like the Arsenal uh, deal, which really elevated a lot of the visibility uh, for the country, given the number of spectators at, at those kinds of events. And we've already started to see that kind of impact on our tourism sector. So I think it's ready to continue to do more of those kinds of uh, activities. Right. Uh, Billy, coming back to you, of course, uh, we understand that the country has an investor code that is uh, advised, uh, that is revised rather, not advised, at least twice after, like at least after every two years, right? And uh, once uh, speaking to the CEO of our RDB, she mentioned something about a predictability, having being able to predict where the uh, country's heading in the foreseeable future and how uh, the businesses are currently uh, performing in the country. Speak to me, do you think there is something that could be done differently about what is currently being done, or are you contented with what is happening? Uh, well, predictability, uh, let me tell you, uh, it's a lot better than what, what I predicted uh, when I first uh, started uh, planning the fir my first project, Marriott, here. Yeah. Uh, many people say, are you normal, <laughs> uh, put up uh, such big investment in uh, a small, tiny country. 
Uh, but that time, uh, we had a few meetings with the government official. You know, we started with uh, the minister of uh, finance, and then uh, the, the, with our LDP people, and also uh, the mayor of Jigali City. Uh, they told me their plan, and uh, I believe in it, and uh, I took the risk. <laughs> and that time was really, uh, many people were saying, uh, 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 uh. but when I also think back, and it wasn't much <laughs> at that time, Tigali was very quiet, no traffic jam, uh, but uh, when I saw the plan of this beautiful uh, conference, uh, conference center, and uh, I saw uh, all the government officials here, yeah, they're really trying hard to push things to happen. And uh, I'm really amazed uh, in the last 10 years that, uh, that I've been working with RDP very closely. And you wouldn't believe the coordination and the support that they give uh, is really amazing. And uh, you know, even uh, when I try to bring people, investors from different parts of the world, it doesn't matter whether it's Saturday, Sunday, you know, one phone call, they come, they welcome people, they explain, they, 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 they tell people, you know, opportunity, how, how good the opportunity, and uh, uh, a lot of things that, uh, uh, that you wouldn't think of a, a, a government body will, will do. So, uh, yes, uh, first of all, it's a lot better than what I predicted. And uh, secondly, I think uh, they couldn't have done better, in my opinion. Uh, so, The governments that we're seeing in Rwanda, how much do they contribute back to the economic growth? Of course, you said uh, something about 7% uh, growth in the past five years at least. But currently, if we take a look back at last year, that was a huge summation of money coming in as investment. How much do we see this having a ripple effect on the country's economy as a whole? I think, you know, the, the, the exact correlation between uh, foreign direct investment and domestic investment and GDP growth, I think is not 100% correlated. I think our goal is to continue to drive the levels of investment both domestically, in terms of the, if you will, the recycling and the redeployment of capital, which I think is a very significant vote of confidence, as well as continue to increase drive of capital from the outside. So, when you look at last year, for example, where we registered $2 billion of investment, half of that was uh, sourced, half of it came from domestic investors, which is really the highest level that has ever been achieved. And, uh, and, a, and a really a, a very good balance in terms of domestic and foreign. From the foreign perspective, we've seen that number increase 20% uh, year over year. That then cascades over the course of five years on, on average for it to then convert into fully operational businesses is, is typically what we tend to see. Three to five years for that registered investment to become an operational business and then of course it gradually cascades through the economy. So it has a very significant impact. Um, and, and that's why for us, the goal is really to continue to drive that kind of investment. There's no debate that those growing investment rates have been a big part of what's driven what you referred to, which is a 7.5% growth rate for the last 10 years. Billy, still on that, as an investor in the country, I want you to quantify, of course, in a terms of at least monetary terms of uh, or maybe job creation how significant has the two projects that you are currently running in the country uh, let alone the other one that is coming up been of significance to this country's economy uh, well currently in uh, Marriott there's over 40 uh, 400 staffs and uh, in uh, Century Park uh, because you know construction is still ongoing um, I think that's uh, nearly uh, 300 staff, uh, workers and staff. So, yeah, uh, and, and uh, eventually will be more coming up. So, 
uh, you're contributing in uh, that end of uh, job creation, but also if we're looking back to uh, the uh, the uh, mice industry, of course, which we're seeing taking a, a very uh, big, uh, you know, contribution back to Rwanda's economy. I just want uh, to quickly run into uh, this conversation again. How do you see the Africa continental free trade area that was signed here a year ago, mm -hmm. contributing to that? Uh, target that Rwanda has, of course, again, looking at how many events have already been hosted in the country and those that are already booked, how do you find that having an effect on an industry that you're currently running in, the hotel space, but also how many doors does this open opportunities for the country and also for investment? I think that is a very, very extremely good opportunity for Rwanda being uh, you know in the heart of Africa uh, that's why uh, I'm partnering with the Italian company that are setting up a factory here that's what they're looking at they're not looking at Rwanda alone because you know they're looking at the the, the strategic location and also uh, the stability of the countries so you know it's like uh, once you know this free trade, uh, agreement, you know, start, you know, working. Rwanda will really have something uh, that uh, many other countries don't have. That was our special panel discussing top investment opportunities in Rwanda. Another important topic covered last year was that of growing female leadership in the private sector. Here in Rwanda, women are well represented in the public sector with the highest percentage of women in parliament worldwide. But female leadership in the private sector is unfortunately still lacking. We sat down with the CEO of Engen, Sarah Dukure, and the co-founder of Right Seat Limited, Denise Umunyana, to discuss how they are making a change for their female successors. When we look at the women in the workplace in general, we can see that the women are there and there's quite a majority of women. But when you go up high on the scale, you actually realize that there are not so many women that makes it, especially in the private sector, there are not so many women that makes it to the top level. And uh, in our industry, for example, in the petroleum industry, we realize that uh, of uh, 30 CEOs uh, in the petroleum industry in our, in our association, we are only a handful of women. Yeah. yeah. So the statistics, statistics are quite, actually quite uh, quite bad in the private sector. Right. Mm. Denise, do you find the same? Yes, actually, uh, touching on what Sir just said, um, looking at, so I've worked in the bank and telecommunications, so those are the few statistics that I know. When you look at the um, number of uh, licensed banks, banks we have here, we have about 16, and out of 16 banks, we only have five CEOs, women CEOs. You look at the insurances, out of 14, we only have three women, not three CEO women. Uh, the government of Rwanda is doing well. In the cabinet, it's 50-50, which is good, but definitely, I think us being here, Sarah, the CEO of Engen, and myself as a founder, we, we, we do not represent, we, we represent a minority, you know, a small percentage of women who have also been given head starts. I would, I would really like to say, at least for myself, that I've been given a head start uh, uh, from the time I was born. I had parents who sacrificed for me to go to school. They did all they could so that I could, I could study. So that, that is a head start. And it's not so many people who get that chance. So um, as much as we're here representing women, let's, uh, let us remember that we represent a very small percentage of those women. Uh, in the seats, and yes, definitely, as much as um, uh, as much as uh, good we're doing here in Rwanda, there's a lot to be done. Like Sarah mentioned, like for example, in pre my previous job, I was the only woman. We were like an executive team of about uh, 12 people, and I was the only woman in the boardroom. Wow. And the interesting part is that when you're the only you're the only woman, but also because I was in HR at the time. When everyone is talking about their areas of expertise, I, the HR person, I'm quiet because I'm not an expert in that area. But whenever it came to HR, everybody became an expert. So even when you're in the boardroom as a woman, you still face some challenges because people feel, men feel that they understand your field and right. you cannot understand their field. So there's definitely still a lot to be done. So keeping that in mind and, and, and knowing that you, know, you, you are women and how you are treated by men, uh, how does that inform the way that you lead other women? 
Maybe we can start off with Sarah again. Okay, so from my perspective, I think it's a bit different because I lead many men um, in, our, in our company today of uh, being head office and, and field amongst 150 people, I would say that women represents about 20%, which is a very, very low. Um, in our boardroom, when we, when we meet as a team, as a um, management team, uh, there's only two women, myself and the HR lady. <laughs> So you can imagine that uh, the, the challenge has been to actually get women to really believe in themselves, believe that they can also rise up and get those positions. That has been my fight for, for some years now, and I'm continuing to do that. Um, I say my fight because I just realized that some of them just don't feel that they have the right to sit there. They just feel that, no, you know, it belongs to the men because the men can talk, they know everything, they know it all. It's we don't know. It's psychological, but uh, I think it's also cultural. Right. So there's a lot to be done in that sense. Mm -hmm. Right. And as someone who is involved in a company that provides HR solutions, do you find that you are sort of prioritizing getting more women out there or working with uh, women to sort of break out of that feeling that, you know, they have to sort of take a, a back seat? Yes, definitely. So it's something we're definitely part of. But as a, a, a service provider, I also don't discriminate. So I'm, I'm supporting as many women, same as men as possible. But what I've seen is that when you're doing recruitment, especially when you're recruiting for uh, like entry level jobs, up to maybe mid level jobs, you see a lot of women applying for positions. But when you go up, uh, you're recruiting for executives, managing directors and the CFOs, then you don't see the women. So you wonder where they are. And sometimes also as women, we tend to unknowingly, uh, um, how can I say, not discriminate. I don't want to say discriminate, but you know sometimes, for example, there's a position that is, in, that is out of town. And then immediately you're like, ah, a woman with a mother will not travel. So somehow you're already biased before right. you even uh, uh, look for this woman. So most of the time what we're trying to do, you, you have to like give double energy when you're recruiting uh, so that you, you avoid those um, un, unwanted uh, biases. So we're definitely supporting as much uh, as many women as possible. But as a service provider, I also feel that it's our responsibility as a woman. They can't feed us. You know, you also have a part to play for you to go and, and, and become the CEO or other higher positions. Right. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you, you, you brought that up because there was a tweet that got some attention um, recently by uh, Patience Mutesi. And she was saying that uh, she had gone for for a job. It was there was another tweet that she was referring to, but she said it reminded her of a time when she was going out for a job, and the potential employer asked her if she was married. She said yes, and if the employer asked her if she had children, she said no. But he said that that was a bad thing because that meant that she would be taking time off shortly to to maybe give birth. Um, she was saying that she understood where he was coming from and she still got the job, but she would have understood if she didn't get the job. Um, there were some mixed reactions to that and I wanted to know what were your feelings on it, the both of you, because it, you know, it is a reality that people at a certain age or whenever in their life, they're gonna to want to start a family, but certain things aren't a concern when you are hiring men than when you are hiring women. Um, so I want to know what are your perspectives on that? Since you brought it up, uh, maybe we can start with Denise. Um, so first of all, I would actually say that uh, in that in that perspective, I, I don't think, I wouldn't have understood if she didn't get a job because she was expecting uh, a baby. Sometimes you also put, uh, put, women tend to be so considerate, but you end up eliminating yourself. So why should I lose a job because I'm pregnant? It's not my pregnancy that is going to work. You know, I have a brain, I can do the job. Uh, so sometimes you also need to really not, uh, f um, how can I say, like, f I mean, is it forgiving the employer? No. So I don't think it's right. It, unfortunately, it happens. And as a woman, what I meant, what I said again, you have to really put double energy in everything that you do. But I do not think, uh, I would not have understood if she didn't get a job because she was pregnant, for right. example. So I think as women also, let us not... Uh, uh, be so, be, have pity, I think, pity right, for ourselves, right, no. Right. Yeah. Or, or, or bring ourselves down, I mean... Or bring it, ourselves it, down, yes. And, and the instance that you're bringing up, it's someone who's pregnant, I think in her tweet, or sometimes a lot what people are thinking is that even before, you know, if you see a young couple that just got married, sometimes employers can assume 
they're going to be having a baby soon enough and that means maternity leave and that means you know so as um, a CEO who is in the position to be hiring people and firing people and giving that that uh, last bit of approval is that something that you consider I do consider it and I'm gonna take my own example so my own experience when I start when I joined engine 10 years ago I was a young woman that just got married six months ago. Three months after I joined, I was expecting. And, uh, and of course, I mean, I, I wouldn't even know how to, to tell my boss that, uh, that I was expecting. I mean, three months after I got a job. So I, I kind of delayed and delayed and up to the point that I, I couldn't hide it anymore and that I had to tell. And, and the reaction was actually quite positive. Of course, it was a handful of men and the company was quite a male dominated one, but they understood very clearly. And, uh, and I mean, I worked my way and uh, I pushed myself quite a bit through to be able to, to push up to the limit. And then I went and gave birth, came back uh, a year after I got pregnant again. So that has been a double. And then they, say, they just looked at me and they say, okay, how many are you gonna have? <laughs> But then, then it, it went on. So, so there is no um, call it uh, forbiddenness that you shouldn't because you're a young woman. You shouldn't have kids before you, you, you rise through the ranks. Now, I think from a very early age, I understood that it is about choice. It is what you want in life, and you have to give it, give it all to be able to get it. So, on your question about hiring, that comes up quite a bit because we have a number of uh, we we do a number of recruitments. And during recruitment, we get a lot of young women. And they, they usually ask the questions about, uh, are you going to have to travel? Are you going to go around? And the question is yes, because I mean, we are a company that, that works on field. Uh, so the question uh, often comes up, and when it does, most of the women will shy away and they'll say, no, I'm not able to do because you know I have a baby, I have this. Mm -hmm. and, and my reaction is immediate, and I give them my own example. It's not because you have a baby that you can't manage it. You have to give it a chance. Just try it and you will see what happens. You will be surprised that you can actually manage it. Right. Yeah. Do you find that as an employer, you are more sympathetic to some of the things that perhaps a woman would go through? Sometimes we hear about in the office, um, you know, women being misunderstood for different reasons. And as two women, in fact, who have families, you know, you understand that hormones are in play, you understand that fatigue can be there, you understand that, you know, capability is there, but, you know, in the end of the day, your physical situation sometimes takes over. When you have uh, an employee or maybe someone that you're recruiting for, uh, is that something that you find that you're more sympathetic about, or do you find that it's hard to balance that because in the end of the day, you're running a business? No, true, the, the job has to be done at the end of the day, and we have targets, we need to achieve them, we all assist on performance, so, so you need to play a part, but you also need to be sensitive about it. And I think us as women leaders, we have that capability to be able to, to balance the two and, and be compassionate with, with other women. We've gone through it, we know what it is. It's not easy to have a baby at home and come in the morning and do the kind of the double shift because, I mean, young babies don't sleep, we know that. So the mother will come in the morning, she's tired, she can't deliver to the expectation. And, and uh, I do push my managers, mostly men, to be able to understand that as well. And, and men do understand those things. Right. They do understand it, but you, you have to raise it, you have to speak up. Right. You can't just keep quiet and, and sit at your desk and start uh, you know, snoozing a bit and they will just feel that she's bored, she doesn't want to do it. Meanwhile, you have your own personal issues. So just raise them up. Our next conversation gave insight into where and how far aid money goes in the hands of international NGOs as compared to homegrown social enterprises. We spoke to a representative from the Segal Family Foundation, the founder of her own social enterprise operating in Kenya, and the DG of Imbuto Foundation representing three links in the chain, funder, entrepreneur, and convener. 
and what we're still doing today is really to look at where the resources are not. Uh, we look at young African innovators um, who, are, um, who have initiatives, who are changing how education systems are, um, uh, are, are, are in Africa um, or how you know, West management is not really uh, something that is looked into in Africa. And those are ideas um, that need to be nurtured and we provide technical capacity that they need but also access to all these resources um, that they wouldn't have access to if it wasn't for a flexible funder but also connecting with other funders to say what is it that um, was the best way to provide um, support to these people who are doing amazing work in their communities but of course beyond that we cr uh, create a network of other um, uh, government and policy makers and, and, and international NGOs where we say um, we've been in this space for a long time what do we see that is working, what do we see that is not working, and how can we uh, create a space where um, these people can, uh, these young innovators who are very um, keen to um, change and challenge the status quo, if I can say, right. um, can uh, thrive and, and really achieve full impact. Right. Yeah. Before we move on actually to Linda's perspective, I wanted to ask you another question. What do you think needs to happen for some of these, these social entrepreneurs, homegrown, uh, to actually be getting this funding to be able to scale? Mm. That's a very good question. So I think I will use um, an example of one of, one of our uh, partners in Uganda, Fondibot. Um, they are um, changing how STEM um, in schools um, is delivered. Uh, Solomon is a person who has lived that broken system, right? He loves sciences, but the way was so theoretical. It was like, this doesn't make sense. We need to understand how engineering works. We need to uh, create a space where our kids can you know, um, use what they learn in physics to actually wire up stuff sure. and um, create irrigation systems and other stuff. So um, what we do is really going the extra mile and find people like Solomon, somebody who wouldn't have credibility um, in front of a big funder to say, who are you to actually, um, you know, be starting this initiative? How do you know that it works? So we, we, I would say we take the risk. We, do that, uh, we take that leap of faith to say, uh, we're here. Uh, we understand your passion and we want to support you. So what's the best way to do that? And so I would say that's one of the ways that... Um, so that's how... Gal uh, yes. handles the situation. Mm -hmm. You know, you you actively search for social entrepreneurs who are homegrown. Yeah. But I suppose the question was, and, and I think I can ask um, now Linda her perspective was, what do you think would need to happen for these um, social entrepreneurs to get the kind of credibility that they need to get that funding? And Linda, before you answer that question, tell me what has been your experience. So. I think for me, I believe, first of all, is that we have solutions to the problems we face, which is the same um, narrative that we actually preach at Akira Chicks. We believe in a future where women are building technologies that mirror the problems they face back at home, and so or the communities that they actually live in. And so for me, it's, um, one of the things that happens is that we believe in ourselves, and so for us to do the kind of work that we do, it's more passion-driven than it is actually more profit-driven. And so being an entrepreneur who's passion-driven is completely different from a for-profit. For, for a driven entrepreneur. So half the time you struggle because you're trying to fix a problem but you have limited resources. And then I feel like most of the times we have the spaces that have been created for like fundraising that actually haven't been put out there for us. It's like I usually say they were built for other people that is not us. And so that's why it's very easy for international organizations to come into the, our spaces and be able to thrive because they're coming in with, with, the, with the resources that, that are needed because they actually access those spaces. And, and I'll give an example of the School World Forum. I just attended my first school um, last month and it's thanks to Seagull um, for just opening up those spaces for us. But if I didn't have Seagull to open that door for me, I wouldn't know um, where to find the people who actually invest in the kind of 
work that we do. So I think for me, it's like when you look at what could be done is um, I think just looking at what Seagull has been trying to do, and especially with the Africa Visionary Fellowship, where you are nurturing and building a lot of like exposing and in the, like, like more like demolishing those barriers that have been set for us and like, exposing us to those spaces, opening up those doors. And just like, because when I look at how I pitch and when I look at how international organization pitches, it's completely different. I mean, I'll pitch, I'm in three, I'm, yeah, I'm working in Kenya in 14 counties and someone will say, I'm in three continents. They're just in three countries. Right. Then, so when you have a funder who's funding scale, they're gonna go like, oh, three continents? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna put money in that. But when I say 14 counties, that's mainly like almost uh, close to a half of the counties in Kenya. That's big, that's basically regional, in more like countrywide. But when you look at those two scenarios, the person will put money into the continent. So just being prepared in how people view and how we pitch to different funders and different donors, I think we need to invest more in that and just lots of training for like and, uh, some of us who are like social entrepreneurs doing our work based on passion and not on the skill that we have or resources that we have. So I think if donors could start investing in like um, just those kinds of training. Short just, training. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Capacity building. Exactly. exactly. You know, you said something so straightforward yeah. uh, that basically you know what yeah. the problems are and so you know how to solve them. Yeah. Um, you know, Sandrine, as a convener, what efforts are you making to be able to sort of uh, close this gap? Ultimately, at the foundation, I believe, uh, like Linda just explained, one of our biggest strengths is that we are present in the community. Mm -hmm. We have been working for the past 18 years in all 30 districts of the country, mm -hmm. which means that we are really where the action is happening. So we have this advantage that we're able to work closely with the government, work with international organizations, but at the same time, being in the community puts us in a situation where we can hear directly from the mother, from the young person, what challenges that they're experiencing. So our role really at the moment is to, one, try to identify the opportunity that's present in the community and try to identify the other person on the other side who's able basically to provide an answer uh, to the challenge that's being experienced. But this being said, um, and I want to touch on a bit to what Linda was just talking about, uh, another issue that we often encounter when it goes to scalability in our context is that when you have a new, uh, um, a new idea that you want to bring into the community, sometimes you find that the legal framework is not ready yet for that kind of uh, solution that you want to bring. So our role now as a convener is also to go back to uh, the other partners that we have from government institution you say, how do we advocate for a new legal framework so we can make sure that in the case of uh, a recent social enterprise that we've worked with, Solid Africa, is able to get to the solutions that they want to bring to, to, to the country, is to say they've been in, encountering this specific issue related to taxes, for instance. Now, how, who do we speak to at the other side on the government level to make sure that this is really addressed? So the next social enterprise that will come after this specific case of Solid Africa will actually find an environment that's more, um, that's more friendly and, like, if I can say, more ready, basically, to welcome this uh, initiative. So I would say that it's definitely uh, always a work in progress. Again, the partnership that we have with Siegel Family Foundation has really allowed us, again, with the flexibility of the partnership that we have with them, is to say we are on the ground, we are seeing the challenge. Uh, do, do not put us in a strict box that say you have to do it this way, no. We have the flexibility to say this is the issue we have identified, this is how we believe it's going to be you know, answered and uh, trust us that we are going to be held accountable for everything that we're going to bring to uh, the community at this point. Right. So far, you know, we've sort of identified two sides already. We've identified what the problem is mm -hmm. and we've identified some of the solutions that I think uh, you're working on. So you said legal framework, uh, Linda said, you know, some training. Um, and I suppose just to kind of go back a bit, um, you know, Siegel is working on this. You're actively uh, looking for entrepreneurs to work for, um, to sort of, well, I, I, I don't know if you're training them, but um, you can let us know that as well. But also let us know why don't you think um, more funders are taking that stance? Actually, that's uh, one point that I was going to raise. So we understand that uh, we are in this sport and we're not there um, alone. So to really win and win big, we have to have every other um, funder um, to I would say, you know, we're trying to get as, ma as many other funders to really start having this conversation. So we use platforms like Transform Africa today, you, you, where you have a lot of different people. Um, sorry. 
um, where we have um, different um, you know, philanthropists and, and private sector and even government to really start having these conversations of what's the role of philanthropy in really uh, pushing the agenda of Rwanda of Africa um, go going forward and how do we do this together. So we are um, really um, ready to learn from others but also creating this space where we're having these conversations where um, as Linda was saying we're not just sitting as philanthropists but also with the doers to say what are the challenges that you have as, um, as, as, as people who are really implementing and how can we as uh, philanthropists, as donors, facilitate the work that you do. You understand better than anyone else. You're on the ground like what Sandrine was saying. You are present with the co in the community. So. Um, we use uh, platforms like Transform Africa, we go to schools, forums, and other spaces where this conversation right. need to really happen and frankly and really look at you know, how, how can we do things differently to really see the impact that we want to see happening. So sure. we are convening as well other uh, influences in this space to um, have this conversation and definitely implement it as we talk about it. Sure. Linda, as an entrepreneur here at the Transform Africa Summit, Liana just mentioned how she's taking advantage of the opportunity. How have you been? Uh, definitely um, taking advantage of all the um, speakers and also exhib exhibitors that are at the conference. Because, I mean, I operate in the field of technology, science and technology. So, I mean, I think right now we're discussing the digital economy. So that means you have lots of technologies around here. I mean, Liquid Telecom and the rest of the teams. And so just being able to like speak to them and not just sit back and listen to people, but being able to go out there and talk to them about what we do and where we work and even just doing research before to see what are our points of intersection and where we could actually do better by being uh, partners with even telcos or corporates and all that. So I think from on my end is more like knocking on every door to see what what opportunities would exist and sometimes they don't even need to end up being money but it could just be placements for some of the students that go through our programs. It could be because we need them to attend our Africa Women in Tech conference and they have a booth that pe people get to understand what does it take to be a woman in telecommunication right. or what do I need, what skill do I need to develop to be a woman in telecommunication. Right. So it's more like well, knocking on every door but also even for our own us guys as social entrepreneurs talking to some of us and, and sharing lessons on, 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 on different things. I mean I've I've, I'm an engineer by, by profession, so I've had to learn how to run a business. And so I would not want to see someone else going through the same problems that I went through. So why not be able to share our learnings and just open doors that in a normal day weren't open for me, but now I can open them for someone else. So it's more, more on a learning from both sides of a social entrepreneur, but also working with the partners that are around here. Right. You know, I think one of the advantages that many of these international NGOs have is that they operate in many different countries around the continent. Um, and a lot of the conversations, since we're talking about being at the conference and different conversations that are happening now, a lot of these conferences right now are talking about integration when it comes to socioeconomic development. So how do you think that all of these efforts that are being made now for integration across the continent is going to affect the way that uh, homegrown social enterprises are going to do their, their operations? I can take on that one. Um, so this this week we have actually we, we it was a, a sort of like entrepreneurship week for us um, as we are launching uh, what we call the social impact incubator um, actually um, tonight um, here in Rwanda. It's it's a platform again that we've created um, uh, to nurture um, the potential and the talent that the social entrepreneurs have um, and to really uh, open doors so that they have access to resources and networks that they need um, <clears throat> to to grow and and to create more impact. As we take a look into our final conversation, we look forward to the future. This panel special focused on how the continent can build climate resilience with nature-based solutions as we all face the fallout of climate change. Nature-based solutions are really thinking about natural resources and the environments in which we already live, and that includes all of us. Um, for developing countries and countries in Africa, nature-based solutions can be very powerful because they actually have social dynamics as well. 
and I really think it's quite difficult to talk about a nature-based solution unless you're talking about something that is specifically geared towards improving livelihoods of people. Luda, same question. Yes, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, nature-based solutions uh, is where we use nature as um, a solution to a societal challenge. And these challenges can be climate, uh, I mean, the impact of climate, climate adaptation or mitigation. They could be disaster risk reduction. They could be about water. Uh, they could be about um, uh, food security. So where we use nature as the solution, and there are many examples. Um, actually, the most quoted example is New York City that gets all its water from uh, an, a natural resource. And it, it, that came about after a big uh, stress and water shortage. And it's used as the biggest example. And I mean, what's happened in Cape Town now, where we experienced last year that there was totally no water and, uh, in the entire city. These are the kind of solutions we are talking about. How is this possible? I'll come, Juliet, throw you here a little bit under the verse. Mm. Rwanda hasn't experienced such shortages, but how is this possible in a continent that is so rich in natural resources, climate-wise? You feel like uh, the need to recycle should be easier here than anywhere else. How can something like what happened in Cape Town happen? in Africa? Well, maybe it's not documented, but I have a feeling it happens. Uh, we, of late, we're experiencing lo long dry spells and very heavy rains. So a season like, such as now, we have a lot of runoff, and two months down the road, we might have a whole lot of shortage, in, especially in the semi-arid areas of the country. So I think the challenge now is how do we uh, make what is now looked at as floods, as uh, extreme weather events, as an opportunity to serve the same population in times of scarcity. Uh, even without making it so sophisticated, how do you store, how do you manage the, the resource for res water in this case, uh, so that it can serve uh, the different purposes, uh, supply um, ag for agriculture, irrigation, and so on when it's dry, in the dry season. So when we don't manage it well, it's lost. It's, it's not only lost, it causes damage. And in the dry spell, we, we are, I mean, we don't have the, the water. You've had, um, especially in the eastern part of the region, uh, where we have a lot of cattle rearing. Uh, those people literally move from their neighborhood to, to go in search for water, especially in the dry season. So I think what uh, my colleagues are talking about is to manage that as a resource and then use it appropriately. Managing it as a resource is easier said than done. Mm -hmm. And that's going to require mindset changes. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll speak from, let's say, my grandfather's perspective. He, he doesn't believe that that water that's going through the, the kraal or can be turned back and you can make it drinking water. How are we going to start with shifting those mindsets? And I'll start with you, Julie, here. Um, yeah, mindset, like you're putting it up. But I think we also need to, to do our role as government, as leaders, to actually demonstrate that this works. Can we come up with a, a multipurpose dam, for example, be able to capture this run of water and treat it and you know, demonstrate that this kind of water is treated to this level and it can actually be used to do all these different purposes, uh, economic activities that we want to. So what I'm saying is, yes, mindset, which, is, which takes a process, but uh, we also need to take it on as a, as a challenge from the government perspective, leaders' perspective, uh, development partners to actually work on that and be able to demonstrate the, the you know, the things that work, pilot, and then people will see uh, something that has worked and that will actually make the mindset shift faster. Luda, you? Yeah, I think to the contrary, um, it's actually not a very big challenge because if you look at local knowledge, mm -hmm. uh, communities have always done, have always used nature solutions. First of all, for things like water purification, you have a lot of indigenous plants which were plant which were, which were by the watersheds. And most of this purified the water to the point that you just drink 
uh, right away from, from, from those wells. Can you drink water right away? Are you confident? <laughs> of course, today most of those indigenous trees have, have, are, are since not there. But uh, it's just, it's just uh, an example of how you know, people have always depended on nature to purify itself and uh, I mean to purify various resources such as water. And um, I, I would think that much as that is on a small scale, mm -hmm. we are really talking now about, when we talk about nature-based solutions, we are talking about using this solution for the magnitude of the kind of problem that we face today, such as water shortage or maybe it may be food security. So that has got to be at a landscape approach. Uh, I mean a landscape level where we are really going to answer the need of um, thousands if not millions of people. When we get to that, Jen, uh, funding is a very big issue, or is a challenge, <laughs> if I'm to be corrected. It's still a challenge, you know, to go out there to set up the pilot, pro uh, pilot projects that the government needs. How do we bridge that gap? So you're right, funding is a challenge, and I think uh, one of our panellists earlier made a very interesting point that there are trillions of dollars sitting on the margins of the global economy waiting to be invested. And a lot of that money is waiting for signals that their investments will be safe over time. And they're also in some cases looking for uh, reduced risks so that they can actually uh, invest their money. When it comes to the three trillion though, I think sometimes it's much more pertinent to talk about a household, for example, or a farmer who is also making decisions about how they invest their limited income. And I agree with Juliet, I think that this is where governments are really important to set the, the pace to actually make decisions around leadership that are geared toward changing behaviour. And when I decide, for example, to uh, plant my seeds at a different time of the year that takes into account the latest science that I've learnt about, um, that can make a really big impact on my yields. Um, but there are also real needs for international partnerships and as you know there's some multilateral and international financing that's been promised under the UNFCCC. Um, and where I think that international money is called for, again it's really important to think about what is the role that it plays. So particularly when we're talking about climate resilience and adaptation where there's not so much private sector involvement, there may be some big needs uh, and, and very good justifications for grant financing in partnership with local finance. But where we're talking about um, sectors and activities where private sector is present, then we're really talking about more limited public finance to address particular risks and returns that the, the private sector demands. Luther, I'll, I'll come back to you there. Uh, just to piggyback off what you were saying, how do you bring the private sector, uh, what kind of conditions do you set to bring the private sector on board to fill that funding up? So the private sector can be brought in two ways. One is, um, Leveraging private sector funding, um, and, and by that I mean already if you have grant funding, uh, there are aspects for which the private sector is not going to invest because the returns are very low. Say for example, in the semi-arid or arid areas, uh, you may find that there's very low business appetite going to such places. And um, if you are going to, um, if you are going to encourage the private sector to put in any funding, uh, into an activity such as uh, uh, supporting some value chains, then you need to be able to support uh, some elements uh, where they would not necessarily put their money. I will give you an example. In Northern Kenya, we have just uh, had a project approved by the Green Climate Fund, and one of the value chains, that's a semi-arid area, it's really dry, affected by drought. One of the main value chains, and these are pastoralists, one of the main value chain is, is, uh, is uh, meat and milk products. Uh, from, from livestock. And, and so when you follow through that value chain, private sector is involved, and actually you'll be surprised the amount of animals that uh, leave northern Kenya to go up to Saudi Arabia every week. It's, it's quite massive. Mm -hmm. But they would not want to invest um, in rangeland restoration or in improving that value chain to the extent that local people can benefit. So the, the synergies which have been created here is uh, from GCF funding, we are supporting things like the um, 
about tours and uh, those other supportive infrastructure that helps them to actually make meaning of their business. And in, in so doing, they're actually bringing in more uh, resources to support uh, restoration work. So it, is, it has to be a win-win in terms of leveraging. Juliet, uh, are the governments, uh, or in particular the government of Rwanda, is it being deliberate enough when it comes to creating these funding opportunities for the development partners, creating space for PPPs uh, with the development partners? And just to follow up on that question, you have startups coming up in the green space. Uh, is the government adapting fast enough in terms of legislation and laws to enable create that environment for these investors to be in that space? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, government of Rwanda recognizes that um, green growth cannot be achieved if the private sector is not fully on board. And when I say fully on board, it's not like we want private sector to come and do something for, for something here and then do something different elsewhere. It, it has to be, uh, you know, in the entire business development. You know, can you think about a, a project which is all sustainable from the beginning to, you know, to the end? So that said, we have different opportunities and windows to, to, bring, to have um, private sector on board. Uh, for example, the Rwanda Green Fund. The Rwanda Green Fund was put in place to basically avail funds to such um, sustainable um, businesses or interventions, so to speak. Uh, from the beginning, I think the fund was more or less responding to the biggest percentage of the support from Fonegua uh, in the past years was not necessarily the private sector fund, the private sector, um, for different reasons. I think one of them not being aware or not taking the time to actually think through a project because as a fund, they have a checklist of, you know, of each idea of a checklist that they go through that a project proposal has to respond to. If it doesn't, that means that project proposal is not going to be funded. So the fund is now is very deliberate to supporting the development it's of faster. such. It's, it's a bit faster. It's coming up. We have a specific window, a private sector facility to literally serve the needs of, from the private sector. Uh, we are seeing a number of proposals coming through, the likes of the ampersand, uh, the people who are bringing on the electric motorbikes. Uh, there are a number of them that are coming up, but this is to mention that, I mean, private sector has to be part of our efforts to grow uh, in the green direction. Thanks so much for joining us for this CNBC Africa special. We look forward to bringing you more exciting stories on everything East Africa in 2020. My name is Makeda Mahadio. See you next time.